speaker. So, welcome. Um, so this is, we have the pleasure of being last of last, uh, which is either a great thing or a really bad thing. Uh, so, um, and we of course also got the pleasure of being in a giant um, theater auditorium. Yeah. <laughs> auditorium. So what I would like to do, because we have actually changed the format of this from what was what's in the um, uh, what's in the write-up, we are. Um, it's going to be much more interactive than uh, what it, what it said. But we are covering the same topic, so don't just leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're going to be talking about is yesterday we had a fantastic session. Uh, to talk about edge computing in the forum, in the fishbowl upstairs. And um, clearly there's a lot to talk about because it was standing room only and we really just started to scratch the surface. So what we decided to do is extend that to today and continue the conversation. And then there's two parts to that. Uh, there's one was the forum, which is up on the screen, and you can join in the Etherpad, please do. Uh, we, the team up here, um, are people who, we are all working on a uh, edge computing white paper that we're planning to publish in um, about a month or so. Yep. Um, and the uh, purpose of that white paper is to really um, High level, identify high level use cases. Obviously, it's not going to be, um, you know, really deep use cases. Although we have about five at the moment, uh, and also identify, you know, quantify what is in fact edge computing and what is not edge computing. And that's really important because I think what I heard from yesterday in the community was that there was a lot of, um, I'd say, confusion. Or maybe not confusion, but there was a sense that, well, we've already solved this problem. Why can't we just use the tools we have? Uh, in fact, one person even said that. And, uh, you know, the group that we've been working on this for a few months, uh, I personally have been working on edge computing for my product um, for uh, about a year and a half. And I can tell you flat out, the tools that we need for, for at least my use case and certainly other people's use cases are not actually there yet. That doesn't mean they can't be, but that's kind of the point of this forum to really explore these use cases and, and quantify where the gaps are and what are the tools that we need to create the, the you know, to fill in those gaps. Uh, so I do invite everybody to come forward because I'm just looking at a bank of lights here. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is uh, start with, you want to start with the white paper, kind of go through a little bit about what we've got? Sure. Yeah, okay. All right. So Chris is going to run the, uh, he'll be the trusty reporter. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. So this... Um, so I can talk, or I think I'm the only one that's uh, mic'd up, actually. You, wanna... you can go ahead and actually explain this. Yeah, OK. Oh, we got a hand mic. Great, great, great. We have a mic, yeah. OK, good. But just okay. paraphrase. I mean, if we paraphrase through the, through the white paper, essentially, the, the white paper yeah. is attempting to uh, discuss the needs uh, for edge computing. Um, we've, we've then described. We can see it. A couple of use cases. Uh, we've picked two. We we haven't tried to be complete in that. Um, and then it's then it's attempting to talk about some of the basic capabilities that we would see at the edge. Uh, simplification of provisioning. Um, some of the constraints that you might run into, and in, in that you have limited compute and networking capabilities at some of these devices. Um, connectivity concerns. Well, the fact that we we expect connectivity to be an issue for edge devices. Um, and it really talks through and starts to dig into some of those concepts, I guess. Um, Do you want to add some? Yeah, so the color? So, Open Dave Conference uh, 
provided an initial initiation of you know, talking about uh, edge computing with the OpenStack community. Not only OpenStack community, but also you know, bringing up other communities like uh, people from CNCF and Linux Foundation. Uh, because edge computing is not just about OpenStack, it's also about you know, like supporting Kubernetes and architecture around it. Uh, so the intent of uh, this particular white paper is uh, really to bring a thought process into what is that you know like we have to collectively be doing in terms of you know uh, addressing the features needed in OpenStack and also integrating into other applications like a container like Kubernetes, Docker, and that's what this white paper is about. And this is a community-driven uh, white paper. There's a lot of people are participating in this uh, white paper. Uh, the questions uh, which actually came out from the developers is that um, what is the exact use cases that we are trying to address from the edge computing and how do we deploy OpenStack and what is exactly needed from the OpenStack. Uh, so in this white paper, there's a couple of things uh, we are trying to achieve out of it. Explaining edge computing because the terminology was like loosely used by many people in a different context. and. Uh, uh, the first section talk about you know like what does edge computing really mean, right? So what's the definition that we as a community are agreeing upon into? Uh, then it goes into the detail of you know like what are the use cases, and it's mostly uh, uh, people uh, in the open dev you know like there was a lot of sessions to flush out you know the details of the use cases, and it goes through the use cases. Uh, after that, you know, like it's really prescriptive uh, definition of the requirements. Okay, here are the requirements that we need to address. Uh, that's the intent of this white paper is to not just to keep it in a very high level, but also actually deep dive into each of the use cases and clearly define what is we have to do from an OpenStack and the integration perspective. At this point, I, I don't have much to add, but one, one, perhaps one thing that I, I, I'd like to stress is that uh, a lot of this is new technology and we try to uh, emphasize that, but it's also deeply rooted in uh, existing technology. So what, what we've done in OpenStack can be leveraged, and we try to understand which parts can be leveraged and where we might be encountering some challenges that would, be, would need some improvement. And I feel we get to the surface of that in the white paper and beyond, really, there's a call for action in terms of the community getting involved and helping us identify what, what really needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about this. So, so uh, Chris and I had a meeting earlier today with, um, with the uh, number of members of the foundation, Jonathan and uh, Mark. and. Um, what what we'd like to do is we'd like to sort of take, you know, this white paper is kind of a high level thing and it's kind of, it's designed to get things started. Um, but we realize that sort of the next step is to take these um, gaps and the use cases that we've identified here and really drill down. And, so, and that's not going to be in this published white paper, um, but that next step has to happen so that the developers can, um, see what needs to be developed. So, so you know, not only should we do we need to identify the gaps, but we need to identify where they are and which, pro which projects they are. Um, so in my mind, there's going to be a lot of gaps in the tooling uh, because you cannot assume that the, the tools that you use within a data center will necessarily work uh, out when you, when you have nodes. You know, first of all, a data center... Uh, you know, OpenStack right from the beginning was never designed to be anything more than maybe, you know, 10 or 20 nodes. I know there are larger, uh, the telcos tend to have a little bit, a few more, but we're still talking about data centers <laughs> where there's reliable power, there's reliable um, cooling, <laughs> there's re racks, there's lots of, you know, lots of network, none of which applies in this, in this edge computing environment. Um, and so, uh, and, and also, don't get me wrong, it is not just a telco use case. I knew this came up in the forum yesterday. Uh, there, there's, um, I know personally, having talked to quite a few customers, 
the, the retail stores, utilities, manufacturing, these are, um, and of course the virtual reality and telemedicine, these are all absolutely real use cases that customers want to have delivered today. And of course it's not quite there yet. So that's kind of the call to action that, that we have and we're looking for the community to really help drive sort of the next, next level down of detail that we need so the developers can start working on creating those tools. Chris, do you want to add something based on? <laughs> um, no, well, just, just to extent, I think, I think you're right in that we need to start to look at, at environments where we can't take certain things for granted. Um, and, and I think what, one of the missions, or at least the mission that I have in mind when, when we talk about the edge deployment is that even though we can't take certain things for granted, we want to have a consistent stack that we're taking into those environments. And, and so we need a stack which is able to accept that certain capabilities or, or, or accommodate certain constraints that, that it doesn't today. Um, and and from, the, from that perspective, we have this long list of staff, we have these wonderful use cases, we, we, we have a, a, a bunch of experiences of, of the people in this group. Moving forwards with the foundation, we need to nail this down and we need to actually start to say, okay, what, what work are we gonna do? Uh, what, what do we need to get done around tooling, um, around scheduling, uh, around location awareness? Um, what are the actual tasks that we want to do? And, and when we get to the point where we've, we've gone through the requirements, we've gone through an analysis of, of, of capabilities available, and we have that list of things to do, that's, that's, when we, that's when we can form around something, we can all sort of huddle and, and start to literally move things along. Um, and, and that's, I think, the journey that we're, we're about to embark on, uh, the journey of, of having, having the guys that are working on this in, in many, many companies, I mean, and, and many, many universities. A lot of people are looking at this, and, and we all have our own thoughts and experiences. We want to bring those together, and we want to be able to, to consolidate that um, and find, find at least that starting point where we can all get together and, and start to drive and move the needle on this. So. That's where we are, I guess. And for this session, Beth, what are we hoping to do? Well, that is kind of up to the audience. <laughs> so um, I see you all are sitting in the back. <laughs> and um, and I, I do apologize, this theater is not conducive to having dialogues with the audience. Um, but I think it's really important for us to really have that dialogue and continue what we did yesterday. Uh, we can continue going through the details of the white paper. Uh, or I think what would be more productive is really start continue that conversation that we had yesterday. Exactly. If you would like Ildiger to, Ildiger to come and visit you, raise your hand. She has a microphone, and we can just start yeah. to sort of talk. There's a hand, somewhere to go. I see. Yeah. But uh, we're not looking for right. You can be asking questions, or you can be giving opinions, or you can right. be telling us the solution. I, all, all options. All of the are above. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are talking more into the telecom and large deployments, the massive deployments, right? But how would you see in terms of like uh, financial industries, right? Or the, the enterprise, right? Have you seen that uh, the implementations or the scalability or the acceptance in terms of the massive deployment of the open stack? Great question. Uh, so let me get back to the, I think the, uh, what uh, applies most yeah. Uh, for the financial institution, for example, is the, uh, is the retail case. As I've talked to a number of um, retail banks, they're interested in branch in a box, retail in a box type. And, and we're, what we're looking for here is commonalities, right? So branch in a box, you know, as in, or, or agent in a box for an insurance company, or any kind of type of, um, you know, anytime a company has a bunch of remote branches and that, um, that they want to consolidate the software that they're using out of those branches into one box would apply. So, of course, with financial services, you have the additional security requirements, so that applies to, uh, certainly applies to telcos as well. Uh, so that's um, kind of my thinking about it. Does anybody else have any thoughts about how financial services... I was going to add. I was going to add a little bit to that. In, in that, um, maybe not financial. Well, financial services, retail, 
from a retail perspective, they'll be running smaller data centers um, in, in retail environments. And the concerns they have there is, is, is data federation, um, transaction continuity. Um, you know, if you lose the WAN, you still want to be able to run your business. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the constraints and concepts that they're looking at there is, is how do we take the stack that we have today that we're using in the environment that we're using it, and how do we handle state transactions? How do we handle security information? How do we continue to run the business when we have that WAN failure? Uh, that's one of the hot topics, I think, that, that really needs to be sort of sought, thought through um, in some of the common infrastructure pieces that we're working with. Uh, I think I would add that, maybe. Yeah, I agree. Any, any other? Oh. Yeah. So one, one more point about financial is uh, I feel, and, and there are a few use cases like that where uh, security becomes extremely important. And how do you do that in the context of the scenario that uh, you just talked about, where, where one right. uh, link back of failure might happen, and how do you reconcile that later on? That may pose a, pose a stress on the infrastructure at some point in time. So right. maybe that's, that's a good use case to look it at. It is a use case, good use case. And of course, you're not, you know, and, you're, and, you're up, and the hardware is not in a data center surrounded by man traps either, so it's, it's generally, um, as one person told me, um, the equipment is sitting next to an oven. <laughs> so you have to think, that, think about you know, making sure that it doesn't get too hot. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that comes up a lot is you know, lightweight OpenStack. And there's not really a clear definition. Some people think talking about you know, putting Nova at the edge or putting a stripped down OpenStack or okay. trying to replace you know, RabbitMQ with that CD or something. Is there? A concise definition of that or a good discussion going on because to me that seems like you know kind of would help bridge the gap with you know with the development community yeah I can start and people can add into it uh, d definitely there is a couple of uh, thinking around what do we really mean by lightweight OpenStack uh, one way to look at it is like it's really come down to how easy the operation is going to be in terms of the deployment and management and upgradability of that particular software, OpenStack, in uh, 10,000 plus location, for example, right? Uh, in the data center, with the 10 plus location or 100 location, even with that, with the tooling set, whatever we have today, it is complex. And when we talk about 10,000 location, you know, we really need to have a very simplified operation. So how do we achieve it? I think there is a multiple way to think about it right now, right? So there is not a, uh, really a one consensus today. That's what we are trying to achieve through this white paper and stuff like that. So the one, one option is like, uh, let's say the option number one is, uh, we could simplify having, you know, like a, a, the, you know, like very, very monolithic module, let's say, okay? A packaged a small module. Uh, the database is actually packaged into it. You know, you don't need, really need a, a very big database into it. And uh, uh, you don't need really a big messaging box. You're really thinking of like something, you know, I'm calling this for a lack of a better term, like a monolithic uh, layer. The other way to think about is like, okay, we package everything using the container the way we do it today and we deploy as a container, but we simplify the operation. So in that case, you know, like it's still, uh, millions of lines of code, but it simplified the way of operation and the deployment, which is basically, you know, like, uh, uh, you don't really need to modify too much into it, but the operation model is simplified. That's the second way to think about it. But I'm pretty sure that, you know, like there will be other ways to think about it. I think in my opinion, uh, the end goal is like a simplified operation deployment and manageability. As long as we achieve that, right, how do we achieve it is like there is a different option. Uh, as long as there's a simplified operation, then it meets the purpose. Yeah, so um, there are two parts to this. I mean, you're absolutely right, operations comes into that. You could argue, though, that operations is a concern at any scale of OpenStack, small or large. I mean, we all care that even if I'm running a 100 or 1,000 nodes of OpenStack, I still won't want it to be trouble. I want it to be simple. Um, in terms of scale, I would look at it in terms of power. It's a nice, easy metric. And I mean actual you know, electrical power here. 5,000 watts, 500 watts, and 50 watts. Think of it in those terms. At 5,000 watts, I can run myself you know, three, four, five servers, probably a few more, depending on how you do it. Um, and we're into the realms of OpenStack as we're familiar and used to deploying it on you know, 10, 12 core, 16 core uh, chips, couple of chips in a box, one U servers. 
um, it's straightforward. You can even have a couple of control servers dedicated or three control servers dedicated if you want to, but you probably want to be using that for compute as well. Um, 500 watts, well, we're now down into the realms of maybe commodity, you know, NUX, shall we say, something of that size. Um, and we can probably still get down to that, um, but the overhead's starting to eat into what we're doing. Um, you've only got so many cores, you're trying to deal with running the control plane on top. Um, but on the other hand, the control plane isn't terribly active because, you know, often these virtual machines are pretty long-lived and you're not sitting there basically hammering neut uh, Neutron with, I will make 10,000 networks because there's no need for 10,000 networks in that sm smaller capacity. So what we want to do here is kind of uh, hive off uh, a core on each box of, say, three boxes to, to run OpenStack, the control plane, and then leave the rest to workload. If we're down at 50 watts, we've got a bigger problem. Um, uh, there's not going to be, you still want redundancy, practically speaking, because that gets you maintainability. Uh, again, if you're distributing this to the edge, then you are going to have the most intelligent person you're going to have out there, the most technically savvy person you're going to have out there is the truck driver with the replacement box. So just bear that in mind. Um, and truck rolls are expensive. Yes, that as well, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so you want this thing to be something where if a box dies, you've got a couple of weeks to kind of schedule a truck roll um, uh, or or more, more importantly, just ship it to them. Yeah, that would work as well. Anything like this. But you, you want time. The, the, the more redundancy you get, the more allowance for time you've got to fix the thing. Um, but at, down at 50 watts, if I'm trying to make three boxes fit in 50 watts, I'm down to comparatively small ARM servers. You know, think Raspberry Pi. Um, you can get down to that. And I'm probably not running virtual machines, although on, for what it's worth, the latest Raspberry Pis, I can run virtual machines. But, but virtual machines are not... They don't pack well. I need to dedicate 500 megs gig to a virtual machine that's running something useful. So in those circumstances, my workload probably needs to, you know, pack into small quantities of RAM, basically. So these, these things are possible. It's just a matter of understanding that we're no longer looking at dedicated compute <coughs> nodes that do nothing but run virtual machines. We're looking at tightly packing the stuff in there. And I don't necessarily think that involves changing OpenStack to make it happen. In fact, I've done three node deployments, and they work just fine. You can, you can do the fencing. You can make this work. One thing you mentioned was uh, message you. Earlier today, we had the session for that Dimitri was uh, uh, talking about the work that's been done in the FEMDC work group where we take a use case like that and really try it at scale and see what breaks. Um, and uh, w w what I'd like is if you do have use cases that uh, you think are interesting and relevant, uh, that uh, where there may be challenges that we, that we don't know about yet because we have not deployed at this scale yet. Well, you know, we'd like to know about those use cases and maybe we we'll try them and and see if there are issues with those technologies or not. So, you know, if you have something, capture it on the Etherpad or speak up. Yeah. Hi, so I'm not very familiar with the work, so I apologize. I can see cloud in the box. I can't see what the other use cases that you've currently got, whether you've got a table that just lists them out point form. But the one I was going to suggest was transport industry. So uh, This is actually retail industry, this particular yeah, that, one. That particular, yeah, so I don't know whether you've just got a, a really simple table that lists them off. Oh, that's a good idea. Could, we don't because have Because it's really it. hard to talk to what's missing when we can't see everything simultaneously. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, so, so I'm gonna. I think we should flick away from the white paper, which yeah. intentionally doesn't talk about all the right. use cases, and go back to the eat the pad, where we should be able to add yes. these things and create nice. that table. Yeah. Nice. There we so, go. So, the the example I was thinking of, I I've worked in the transport industry, and the guys used to. Uh, I worked with a, a tech dev team. I call them guys because I was the young girl. Um, they did a ruggedized box that went out to branch, <laughs> effectively branch offices, but the branch offices were sites that moved around. So they're building a bridge, it sits there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, they also have projects where, which are literally on the road moving, so, and they actually want to do work while they're moving. So I don't know whether, apart from environment, heat, humidity and so forth, you've got the problem in maintenance sites of lots of metal moving around and how that impacts RF and things like that. Um, That's extreme so, conditions, right? Yeah, so. yeah, it's extreme, but transport industry. So it's just a right. use case that you might want to add in if you haven't got uh, Yeah, it was suggested um, the uh, navies have, um, they want to consolidate on the ship down to a cloud in the box. And that's extreme because you know, they, they're talking to a satellite. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, well, that's the other example I was about to give, that they actually have satellite option for the network. So I don't know whether you've run through the different type of network connectivity that you'd have for, for a remote box. We, we, I think we've, talk, we've talked through the fact that there will be different types, but we haven't really talked about any design capabilities required for any specific types. I think we, we more talk about the, the experience than the, than the, the, tra the transport. Right. Yep. I think that gives... Um, it's interesting. It's not the, the, this is a requirement that came up to me. We we're talking about something completely different the other day. Is that when you're doing remote management, you're doing remote management with uh, by you know downloading upgrades, for instance, of the platform and of the software that's running on the platform. If you've got a satellite link, it's not just intermittent. It's kind of expensive. So so how much management can you truly do on on a dribble of connection? And how do you avoid that management operation as long as you possibly can? And I don't have an answer for what it's worth. It's just one of the many questions we end up with here. Right. So, so another issue for the, that you need to consider is um, where the data resides. So that's something we do talk about in the white paper, but I think um, we should probably beef up that section, which is you really want to keep the data as close to the end consumer or um, either the consumer or, or the, where the data is actually getting generated um, to do the processing, particularly if you have um, the example that I'm using is uh, utilities um, and the uh, oil and gas industry. So they have uh, oil rigs uh, or, uh, you know, um, pumps all over wherever, and usually in pretty harsh conditions like the Gulf of Mexico or off the North Sea and in uh, you know, northern Europe. Uh, and so those are extreme conditions and they're remote and they're pulling a lot of data from those, from those rigs. Um, and you don't want to bring all that data unprocessed back to a data center um, in, you know, in some cozy location. You really want to use a concentrator to bring the data back you know, maybe to the rig uh, you know, or the oil platform uh, do the initial pass, get the data down to some reasonable small packet set um, and data set, and then put it put it back up to the to the data center. So that that's one scenario where you have uh, high latency, uh, uh, low bandwidth locations, many hundreds or thousands of locations, and a lot of data. This one, I think, it repeats over and over again. I mean, we talk about. Um, getting the uh, compute close to the person who's using it frequently. Um, and that's one use case. But this is another use case where what we're trying to do is um, optimize the backhaul. And, and it comes up in internet service yeah. providers all the time, right? We, we're all used to the idea that you cache content close to the, uh, to, close to the edge to try and reduce the backhaul. Um, but, but, you know, there are other ways and means of optimizing internet connections as well in service providers. So that use case is, is a pretty re common repeating thread across, uh, or need would be a better put it, way of putting it, is a pretty common repeating thread across many use cases. Right. I, I do. Um, so it, this is a little bit off of the networking topic, but so one of the things in conversations the last couple days um, that I've been trying to parcel through, and I'm interested to hear that I know there'll be different opinions with this, but when we talk about edge computer edge cloud, we have a tendency, or at least I've had a tendency to think of it the way we thought of data center clouds that are elastic and you know sort of designed for people to bring their own workloads and use the APIs in sort of unknown ways. But it strikes me that a lot of the edge infrastructure is not in that model, that if you know the, the cases you're describing, you're pushing a set known of a number of applications and you don't expect the people at the construction site to decide to you know, run Cloud Foundry for the weekend <laughs> unexpectedly. Um, exactly. So I'm interested to hear what the balance is between the you know, sort of dynamic workload that we're used to in cloud that we sort of, I, I associate with cloud and edge infrastructure that might use very similar APIs. Right. Uh, I'd keep hold of that, Mike, because I have a question for you. So um, if you imagine, say, eBay, um, how many applications or how much variation in applications do you think eBay is running? They have a tremendous number of applications. Um, now, but I mean, uh, one thing about this is that they, they've got 
a number of fairly well-trodden paths, and I think they probably started with a fairly small number as well. And that number mm -hmm. wasn't terribly variable because they were making cloud for their own use. Well, th this reminds me of a conversation I had with a major retailer who has run stores, and every store right now has exactly the same mix of applications, whether they have a pharmacy in the store or not, whether they have a tire center in the yeah. store or not. Uh, because they need the homogeneity and they don't expect the person working in cosmetics to, you know, you know, want to use the API of their cloud infrastructure. That would not be a good thing. I, I think that's maybe the, the, the key point. Um, as, as much as there may be multi-tenancy or there, there may be different uses for certain infrastructures which are in a distributed environment, um, I think the, the principal activity that we should be looking at is how to simplify workload management for remote devices and remote workloads, whether it happens to be purpose-built because it's in a particular site or environment or, or whether it happens to be deploying on a, on a generic compute that happens to be located nearby. It's, it's really the simplification of the operations and the lifecycle management and, and establishing an environment that allows that in the edge that I think should be our primary goal. Um, and, and where the focus should be, um, it depends who you're talking to as to what their focus is. I think that's going to be market driven. Right. But, but it's, it strikes me that, and this is, I guess, where I'm trying, it, these are not ad hoc environments in the environment. You know, they're not, they're, we're not trying to create. And so at the edge dev thing, we talked about these being mini clouds and micro clouds. And one of the things that sort of comes with that definition is the idea that you're going to log into the API and do work against it. But it, none of this strikes you're, me. You're as, right. As they, the they are. They do tend to be stable environments. So, uh, you know, and I'll use my own use case: virtual network services. You know, we have, um, you know, a router. We have a security device, and we have a WAN optimizer, and maybe a couple other networking services. We're not going to change them very often. <laughs> I mean, how many customers are going to say, oh, you know, I decided but, to change no. my, my security? And yeah, they'll do it maybe once a year. <laughs> but, but you might have a customer of your fleet, 10 per, you know, one customer might be 10% of your fleet, and that customer might say, you know what, I want to run this special application on my 10% of those fleets. And you have to be able to accommodate that right. tenant case. In a, it, so it's not 100% uniform, but it's not it's not each site. It's a one deployment for that customer that touches in a consistent uniform right. way. And right. I'm trying to get, try, try and find the right way to articulate that because you are unique per site, sort of, but you're not making the decisions at the site. You're making the systems from the, the right. administration. I think, uh, I mean, I would go with the flexibility being useful and it will be used. Um, and even right in Beth's case where she's the company providing the application that runs on the cloud, it doesn't alter the fact the reason they're putting a cloud there is so that they've got that flexibility, so that when the next great thing that they want to sell, what they think is going to yeah. make them their billions is, is ready, they, they can put it out there. Well, the and the customer, I mean, I can tell you from talking to customers, they're, they're really excited about the idea that they're not, it's not vendor lock-in for them. Even though they may not change very often, the fact that they have the capability of changing is very attractive. But, uh, I mean, if you look at, well, signboards, let's take signboards as an example. You've all seen signboards that crash, and they all have windows on them. They all have blue screens on them. The point is, things like that, it may well be that they're pretty dedicated to a single kind of purpose, or, you know, point of sale, same sort of principle, quite often a Windows box. Um, but having a platform there that you can put additional things on that is a standard um, makes it more flexible, makes it more usable for the person deploying the cloud, even if what we're saying is not there isn't a massive administrative separation between the cloud operator and the application provider, if they're the same group. Uh, I'm, you know, we see in normal cloud behavior, there are plenty of us out here that run private cloud, um, where the operator and the application provider is fundamentally the same, at least the same company, if not the same team. And it feels to me like this might be another one of those use cases. Before, before we move on, sorry, um, I, I just something that pops to mind, um, my, my kid plays League of Legends, um, and League of Legends is great, it, you know, his five friends that are all in the neighborhood get together and they play. Um, I, I can imagine a situation where, to mitigate the frustration of these kids and the lag they get, 
that if I was running that service, I would find a location as near to those kids as possible to spin up that instance for the period of time, the 15, 20 minutes it takes them to play that game, which would then disappear afterwards. But that's not something that I can say that this is a requirement, but that's something that I would assume will take advantage of the such capability if it's made available. But yeah, anyway, to the point. Sorry, question. Yeah, um, there are a few things that I, I, I heard during this discussion. One of them is that we really need to take into account that the fact, the fact that the applications need to be redesigned. To, you know, when you keep saying, oh, the data is going to be sent over to this, well, that application that is doing this thing has to be designed with edge in mind, and right? And, and so, well. <laughs> That's a scary um, thought. <laughs> Well, and, and the example with the uh, League of Legends, you know, that application has to be able to locate and route according to the network topology and location uh, uh, awareness of the players. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, uh, so the application design changes are required and people need to be aware. The other thing is uh, I, I, I hear use cases all over the map from Raspberry Pis to data centers that are a bit closer to the, uh, to, to the edge. I think it will be useful to kind of get the low-hanging fruits where, you know, if OpenStack wants to do something, you know, let's look at things that look more like data centers um, and, and progress towards the ones that are Raspberry Pis. And this way, you can, you can kind of enhance the capabilities um, instead of going all over the map into, in, into that space. Yeah, um, so I, I, from an application perspective, what you're talking about is like absolutely true because uh, without a proper set of APIs and having an application behavior to uh, load the data into the edge and only needed data at the edge, and as well as, you know, like offering uh, in uh, latency uh, sensitive processing for that particular application which is supposed to be using the edge computing. That is pretty critical and you are absolutely right about that. Uh, but in terms of the sizing of the cloud, the edge cloud, how big it is going to be and, uh, you know, depending upon the use cases, you know, like it's definitely going to have different sizing, but it is definitely not like hundreds of computers, right? Then it would treat it as it's like... It's mostly uh, not even going to be racks. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I, th I think from a telco perspective, at least, you know, we can think of like, you know, uh, less than 10 computers, right? Let's uh, less than 10 compute. And in some cases, you know, like if you're deploying in a customer place, you know, it's a single piece of box, it could be. So anything... Uh, but it's really the use case is going to define what that capacity is going to be. But we really need some sort of a flexibility there. But again, it goes on to the other question that Rob was asking is like how prescriptive the application has to be, right? Uh, if you define this very prescriptive just for a one piece of box, right, like a small Raspberry Pi sort of a thing, can I take that and put it in 10 computer oriented orchestration, right? So that's a bargaining we have to see whether we're going to develop like a, a small, medium, and big, or whether we're going to develop something that can actually operate in this particular scale, right? I think, <clears throat> in my opinion, if there is a way to operate in that particular scale so that it, defi it, it eliminates the need of like a developing multiple aspect of the control plane, I think that's, that's a key. Uh, but again, it really goes on to that prescriptive nature, actually. If it does get too complicated, then it's very hard to manage in the number of locations that we have to and, deploy. And there was one more point I was going to make. Um, with the use cases, I like them as a story, but it would be useful to inject the actors. The key point about this, who owns what, who controls what? Um, you know, do you have a box that you give to a customer and have no access to, 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 to change, or do you have a mini data center that acts like a multi-tenant, and, and these need to be articulated because that's where the touch points start to emerge. Let, let me let me talk about that because because I so so I, I'm confronting that directly. Um, you know, telcos have always been really careful about what's the DMARC, and up until the edge computing has come along, it's been generally pretty easy, right? Because we have a router, right? So we have a a, a cable, you know, we have a T1 connection or, you know, whatever, and, and plugs into a router. And it's pretty clear that the router belongs to Verizon, and then there's a cable that goes to the rest, of, you know, to the company, and 
that's the land and that belongs to the company. This gets much muddier. Um, so we, you're absolutely right. We need to really define what that is. I'm actually working on a concept of where the telco owns one piece of this box and then the customer owns another piece of the box. <coughs> is it piece like sides or is it top? It's, <laughs> no, it's I, inside. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying <laughs> Good is, question. It, is it, is it yeah. infrastructure platform software or is it platform, platform, platform? Yeah, um, it, or software, right. software, software. You're right, because an, an, another use case, different from the one that, that Beth was talking about, is the use case where the person owning the box, the person owning the virtualization layer, and the person owning this, the application that runs on top, those may all be different entities. Correct. And how do you deal with that? And that, that that's something that's perhaps a little more familiar to the cloud, at least from the infrastructure versus the application. But here we have one more layer of complexity, which is the the box itself may not be the same as the virtualization layer and the management of that virtualization right. layer. Well, one thing, I, I'd like to bounce back on something you said earlier about um, uh, uh, having uh, homogenous uh, edge devices. And as much as I would like to, to achieve that, I, I don't think we'll be able to do that. There's so many of those edge sites that in inevitably they will be all be different from each other. We'll have different versions. We'll have different size. We'll have different types of hardware that will be in this, that will need to coexist right. at some layer. And, and some and some will be owned by the telco, and some will be owned by the the the, the local. Just company. to clarify, I didn't mean to kind of put things in a box in terms of you know scale and size. Yeah. All I was trying to to say is that because the problem yeah. is so yeah. fuzzy. Um, it, and, and because the, the, the open stack community has expertise in a certain area, move towards the edge ra rather than, you know, That's, coming yeah. the other way around. We don't um, call it foggy rather than fuzzy. Right. <laughs> right. On, the, on the other hand, the practicality of it is that, you know, my company already has done it. We have a product we're selling, <laughs> and it's in a box. <laughs> How many people in the room have, have edge offerings today or edge plans for this year? Oh. So, yeah, couple. so oh, I think I'm being cut off. You're um, going to close I'm it actually, I'm actually going to cut us off. Um, yeah. we, we are a little bit over time. Um, the conversation is going to keep going. We, we are going to incubate some work with the foundation to, to make sure we drive the topic forwards and we figure out exactly where to focus and, and what we're going to achieve uh, and put some targets in place and, and really kick some, some real work off. If you're interested, find this, find this um, web web. Uh, Ethan, pad, sorry, um, sign up and, and you'll be included. Otherwise, reach out to, to any of us or the foundation staff and we can make sure that you, you, you right. round in. This is the easiest way is on the Ether pad. But uh, I'd like to thank the panelists and our, and our support staff. Um, <laughs> and thank you all for coming. We have to shut down now. Right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>